Uh, now we have 51 participants, 52 and more people are joining. Um, uh, and um, uh, let me introduce uh, the, the whole idea to, for, those, for those people who participated. We are starting our um, a series of webinars uh, called Arbitration Kitchen. And the idea is that arbitration stars will share their famous recipes, uh, how to prepare national dish. Uh, and we are very lucky today uh, to have JK, General Director of LCAA, um, as uh, our first star speaker and the first star cooker. Uh, because uh, Jake shared with us, is it, is it your husband on the back? Yes, this is my husband who is very okay. keen to make an appearance. Oh, okay, it's very good. <laughs> now you're also part of the history. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, uh, so Jake shared with, with me her secrets that one of her hobbies is actually cooking. Uh, That's so exactly right. Yeah, uh, so we decided uh, to start with Jake. And what we are going to cook tonight, tell us. Yes, yeah, so tonight we are cooking asparagus. I will show you um, some of the things I've prepared. Um, asparagus, I will explain in a moment how we're going to prepare them. White asparagus with potatoes, um, herbs, eggs, and ham. And then this is served with a, a simple butter sauce. So what is spe what's special about it is that these are white asparagus, which are only available very short time of the year and not in every country in the world, I think. I think, that, I think in England you can get them sometimes, but it's a very sort of Dutch German type of asparagus. So now is now it's a good season for white asparagus, right? Yes, although this immediately shows you how Dutch this is. I, I ordered the asparagus that I wanted to use and um, I order everything now by email, go and collect everything at my green grocer. And when I came to pick up the asparagus, he said, I put everything in the bag that you needed except for the asparagus because I think they're too expensive. So this is something that only Dutch people will do. They refuse to sell you something if they think it is too expensive. And then he explained to me that it's been a little bit too cold, which is why they haven't been um, uh, available as much as they normally would be, but it's, it's starting now the season. Okay, uh, but for example, in Moscow, I normally see green asparagus in the supermarkets. If you have green asparagus, what we need to do with it to, to make yeah, it? Yeah, green nice asparagus way? are in a way easier because you just chop off a little piece at the end and, and, and you boil it and that's fine. The white ones have a finer taste and a finer texture, but you do need to uh, slice them. So if you permit me, I'm going to put on my apron and I'm going to start if that's okay with you oh absolutely yeah, so this Jackie, is a very dutch apron yes yeah yeah jackie we just had a small chat before this webinar and uh, actually what is what is sold at uh, shippel airport as souvenirs from netherlands with nice yes. prints of uh, windmill is actually not really dutch no, no, no. <laughs> so it's a product so, for tourists exactly so the first thing i do of course is wash my hands i do that always in certain in these times of crisis and then I'm going to show you hopefully if, if this works with the camera how to um, slice or how to peel these white asparagus it's a little bit finicky and I did it um, in advance for the bulk of them so as I said for the green ones you don't need it but for the white ones you need to slice off now I don't think you can see well what I'm doing here so let me see uh, we still can yes now it's yes yeah yes I need right to... position. Uh -huh. is this okay yes yeah absolutely okay. yeah, we can see so it. you take a one of these slicers and you just slice off the outer layer and it's a little bit difficult to see what the outer layer is but that's quite woody and basically not edible and then you chop off a piece about this much and you throw the rest in the pan. So I have another one, which I will use as an example. And people who have the green ones, just rinse them, chop off the end bit, and then you're done. So I'm done now. I will put these, I'm sorry, put these outside later. Um, and now the asparagus are done. 
Um, do I cook or do you question? <laughs> uh, yes, actually, I think you should cook. We need to start the process, and while we were yes. waiting, then I'll be asking you. All right. So, um, so just thing, um, explain to me what you did. You put asparagus in a in a pot, in a big pot. That's right. And um, uh, with water I, I, or without water? No, not yet. So, and I'm also not starting with the asparagus. So they're now ready, and they're sitting there in a big pot. Um, I will show you the. Uh, um, the pot where they are. I hope you can see them. Those are the potatoes. And the trick about this meal is that everything needs to be served pretty much at the same time. So I need to boil potatoes, which is about 20 minutes. The asparagus shouldn't be more than 15 minutes. Eggs, which shouldn't be more than 10 minutes. And then the butter, which needs to um, uh, just melt. Also, you need a hot plate at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm taking some platters. Um, this, incidentally, is very Dutch to have um, um, this built into the kitchen. So you have this long, narrow corridor. And then here in the kitchen, you have the crockery in, in, a, in a corner cupboard. Um, I'm going to put the pans, the serving dishes, in the oven so that they are warm warm by the time we eat okay then i think what i'm going to do is to prepare the eggs for boiling i take one of these little lethal instruments and drill a tiny hole in each egg that i'm going to be using why you do it because otherwise if you boil it the whole egg will break and you no. end up with omelette <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, well, in Russia, when we boil it, uh, it doesn't break. Maybe because Russian eggs are stronger than Dutch eggs. <laughs> I was going to say, you must have superior eggs. <laughs> 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 so I've learned something already. <laughs> right. So while I do this, please continue with all your questions, because you sent, sent me a scary number of questions which you want to discuss with me. Uh, I'm well, adding water to the eggs. Yes. Um, yes, we actually went through a significant part of questions because you explained already uh, something about ingredients and, um, and asparagus and the wine, which you commanded and we sent it in yes. advance. Yes. Uh, and normally you, you open wine after you finish your cooking or before you start <laughs> cooking? <laughs> Let's let's say normally during the cooking, during. but I thought I would uh, I would get things going, and then once everything is in the pot, I will open the bottle. I will show you the bottle. I will open the bottle, and um, uh, and have a glass. So what I just did, I turned on the gas because of course in Holland we all cook on gas, preferably Dutch gas, although in 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 some cases of course Russian gas. Um, so. Turn on the egg, and once it boils, I will time it. Okay, so I'm you will boil, boil eggs for how many minutes? Um, I like them not too hard, so maybe five minutes once they are, once the water boils. Okay, like that. so it will be yeah. 6.15 Central European time, right? No, no, because the water, it, I put, put them in cold water. So in once water. it boils, five minutes. So I will five tell minutes. you when the five minutes starts. So, so for, for now, the water is just heating up. In the meantime, I'm going to chop some of the herbs that I'm going to be using. Um, and I don't know if you can see this. What um, are the herbs? Oh, okay. It's yeah. a mixture of chives and uh, savory, or lovage, I think it's called. So it doesn't really matter, just green herbs. You can use some parsley, you can use, well, chives. Um, and I use them, that is not really part of the traditional Dutch recipe, but I add them to the potatoes uh, to give them a little bit of flavor. The potatoes are very Dutch. Um, they are the so-called new potatoes, which again are seasonal. Uh, so the little ones, which you can get in other countries as well, but at this time of the year, they have a really good taste. I boil them with the skins on, and then when they're done, I add the herbs and some butter. So you have in April already potatoes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. So I'm now adding cold water to the potatoes as well. Um, again, once it boils, it's about 20 minutes. So um, yes, I'm going to turn on the uh, the water of the potatoes as well. 
again, cold water, just like the egg. Uh, let me see which. So you're boiling at the same time eggs, potatoes, and asparagus, right? Yes, well, the asparagus are not on yet, but, but I will put them on. So as I said, that's the, the only slight, it's very easy, this recipe, but it, the, the, the issue is, do, is getting the timing right. Mm. And also the potatoes, I should say, that's another similarity perhaps between Russia and the Netherlands. The only thing that is truly Dutch in terms of food is potatoes. Only we don't make vodka out of it, we just eat plain potatoes. And what is really Dutch is to mash up potatoes with whatever vegetable is available. But my family refuses to eat this typical Dutch dish, so that's why I'm not serving it tonight. So I'm now chopping the herbs. Okay, okay. Uh, by the way, Russians do not, uh, well, Russians could do vodka from everything, uh, including the wooden chair, according to some uh, literature. <laughs> uh, but traditional one is from wheat. Potato right, right. one. Uh, okay. You have you have you will have headache after uh, next morning. So, <laughs> so normally it's not recommended. Uh, but but I understand that in New Zealand you are normally drinking beer, and the New Zealand is famous for beer, right? Yes. And yes, wine. That's right. And wine and Geneva, which is sort of our vodka. Um, it's 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 a, a sort of gin, if you will. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Uh, well, I understand. Uh, I mean, if if you could still do your work and answer my question. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I understand that you are now in the Netherlands. In which city? Yeah, I'm in the Hague. In Hague. Very close okay. to the feet, to the Peace Palace. Yep. Yeah, and uh, what what what? Uh, who is working at LCAA <laughs> if you are now in the Netherlands? <laughs> no, it's, uh, sometimes on a flight you could see a pilot uh, sitting somewhere and relaxing and then you ask yourself who is driving uh, the jet. Right, right. No, no, no. The jet is completely under control. Um, we have been working remotely for uh, a bit more than two weeks now. So it became obvious that the government also in England was gonna impose measures, understandably, that, that offices would need to close. So two weeks ago, Thursday, two weeks ago, we closed the office. And basically within one week before that, we had converted the LCA into a remote uh, office. Everybody was provided with computers or insofar as they had computers, we ensured that you know the safety measures were in place and we um, sent everybody home. Um, I stayed in the office for one more day with one or two people and, and then left, which really felt like the captain leaving the ship as it is sinking. But the good news is all 43 people are working remotely and it is entirely business as usual. We're using Zoom quite a lot for, for various meetings, mm -hmm. but yeah, the LC now operates remotely. So you accept cases, but you accept cases only electronically, right? Correct. So, so I think the first week we had something like 27 cases come in, absolutely no sign of any slowing down. Um, under the 2014 rules, pretty much everything is done electronically anyhow. Um, there are very few things which, in line with what other institutions are experiencing, needs to be done in paper, on paper. Um, it's quite rare and, and of course we encourage people now to do everything electronic, electronically which is also in the interest of people bringing the cases. So it is only some old let's say legacy cases where we wouldn't have email addresses where we, where we may find that we at some point for instance need to send out an award in paper on paper which we can do um, but pretty much everything happens electronically now. So if I file a request for arbitration on paper form, it will be delivered to LCA, but you will not start the case? Or uh, oh yes, no, no, no. We, we, also, we, we also accept uh, paper filings. We just encourage people, you will have seen all these institutions do the same thing. Encourage people, please, to file and uh, file electronically. This is the egg. So now I'm going to turn on the timer for, I think I'm going to do six minutes. Um, for the same reason that we are not physically in the office, other people are not physically in the office either. So I think it's a shared interest to do as much as possible things uh, electronically. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good, good. But but uh, I, I hope that all people we shall say are okay. Uh, yeah, everybody is well. We are, you know, knock on wood. Nobody is ill, and um, people have adjusted incredibly quickly to this new remote environment. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting it's easy, and I'm also not suggesting that it, as this continues, it will it will be challenging to keep everybody motivated and happy. Some people have children at home. Some people are completely alone at home. Uh, some people don't have great facilities at home, but overall it, it's gone quite well and we are lucky to have all the work that we have with the new cases coming in and, and, and the ongoing cases. Uh, what's happening with the hearings? Uh, you know, that's a good question but you know of course for us the, um, the hearings are the part of the proceedings that we have least influence over or actually involvement in. That is up to the arbitrators and they choose hearing centers um, we do see in the cases that we administer a lot of correspondence about hearings, but it's not something that we ourselves are involved with. Um, I do in my own arbitrator cases, of course, need to deal with making the changes, but we don't make the changes in LCA cases. What we are seeing is, is a mixture. People are postponing some hearings. People are converting hearings into remote hearings. People are making hearings shorter or saying, oh, do we actually need a hearing? Uh, it is interesting how all of this forces, well, to rethink things a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still drinking water, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, how, how do you cope with self-isolation? Uh, what you do? How you kill your time? <laughs> Well, there's not very much time to kill, so that problem resolves itself. Uh, also, because I, um, uh, the, the, the closing down of the office coincided with my teaching at Leiden University, where I've been appointed a professor a while ago. So also there, we had to convert the course into a remote course with all the challenges and software that that brought. Um, and as I said, you know, I have a couple of cases as arbitrator. For some reason these cases seem to be as active as, as ever. But I actually, I'm pretty used to working by myself. Um, it's interesting that I'm now in The Hague. Normally during the week I'm not here, so my family may be very sick of me uh, in a couple of weeks. But I go for a run in the morning and um, at night we have dinner together, tonight the asparagus. And one of the main things I do now is I listen to music as I always do. Music is always important to me and, and, and that keeps me, um, keeps me motivated now as well. What kind of music? Is it rap or something uh, fashionable? No. Uh, did you say fashionable? Fashionable, yeah. Fashionable, okay. Um, I don't know if it's fashionable, it's possibly very unfashionable. No, um, classical music and in particular chamber music, although at this time of the year, well, you could say fashionable, in, in the lead to, in the time leading up to Easter, Holland is obsessed with passion music. Uh, so uh, in particular Bach, the St. Matthews, St. John's Oratorium, pretty much every night there's a performance, people debating um, uh, actively which performance is superior. So um, yeah, the classical music. Ooh. Incidentally, I'm preparing to put some butter in the saucepan. Now, I said 100 grams. Frankly, I never know with butter how much it is. I should mention that I like to make this meal with good olive oil rather than butter. But that's not the Dutch thing to do. The Dutch thing is to use butter. So for you guys, I am sacrificing myself tonight and I'm using butter. You do need quite a bit of it. So in that sense, from a cholesterol perspective, it's probably not the healthiest dish. Um, and it seems to disappear when you melt it. So I'm using quite a bit. I don't know if you can see it. Just yes. chuck it in a little saucepan. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. It's good for you. It's more than 100 it's grams. Not, it's more, yeah, it's probably, uh, well, 100, 120, something like that. Um, I'm not turning on the heat yet. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm boiling some water now, which I will use for the asparagus. Um, uh, so you don't put you don't put uh, asparagus in uh, cold water. So you boil. No, no, 
no. I, I use boiling water. What you should do, I guess, is boil the water in the pot and then add the asparagus. But it's quicker to use the uh, electric cooker um, to get the water boiling quickly. And then I add it to the asparagus. Ah, that's the eggs. So um, eggs are done. And what I'm going to do now, which I think is also very Dutch, is I'm going to scare them. Do you do that in Russia? Yes. Vital. You, how do you call this? I don't know how you call this in English. Um, but you, if you don't do this, the peel doesn't come off. So I yeah, yeah, you put them in cold them. water. Exactly, exactly. So that's what I'm doing now. Okay. That's that. So that's done. And oh, I forgot to put some salt in the potatoes. So that's what I'm doing now. I'll add some, I'm using some sea salt. And the water in the kettle is about to boil. This is all good news because once everything is in the pans, I'm going to open a bottle of wine. So we're almost there. Okay. But what is really nice, the weather has been amazing. So in the mornings I go for my run and um, we are in a sort of, they don't call it lockdown uh, altogether, but I think it is essentially what it is. Most shops are closed except for food shops and um, you're not allowed to um, you know, get too close to other people. So basically there's nobody on the streets. There are not, very few cars, very few bicycles. And one of the few things that you can do is, is go for a run. So I go at 7.30 or something and you see one or two other idiots running around, but otherwise there's nobody on the street. So it's actually a very nice way to, uh, to start the day. Yeah, and for how long you normally run? Uh, uh, short you runs. I, I just go for half an hour because I go every day now. So I need to be a bit, A, I'm not, I'm a very bad runner. Let's, let's not. Um, but it's nice to go outside and I do some exercises halfway and um, yeah. Asparagus are now in the pot as well. So you also add salt to asparagus, right? So before yes, you add the salt to potatoes, yeah. now to asparagus. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And what is nice about the asparagus, um, I think they're going to be done before the potatoes are done, but um, you can just leave them when they're done in the warm water. Um, and thrifty Dutch people um, uh, make soup out of the water. I think we're getting questions through the... Uh, yeah, uh, well, some people said uh, that I should tell you that jogging is uh, prohibited in Moscow. Uh, is it? I'm not sure about it. Well, I live actually on my, on my dacha, uh, so there's no one to prohibit me from walking with my dog. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is the wine now. Ah, it's this is... A very nice, I mean, I mean it's, it's not super special, but it's a nice, white bourgogne 2018 and i think it's time to uh, to open the bottle yes it's uh, time because to open the bottle and talk about you <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, because um, um i've got from you very nice photos and i want to share with with people okay uh just a second uh, can you see it no you cannot uh just a second uh, share screen. Um, yes, here it is. Can you see Cheers. it? Cheers. Yes. <laughs> yes. You you recognize yourself, of course. This is university, right? Uh, this is actually my PhD graduation. Okay. Um, yes. So um, this is the oral defense of the PhD uh, process, which is a four year thing. And behind me, you see, that's very Dutch. It's something similar to having bridesmaids when you get married. When you do your PhD here, you may have two people who are there as your support act. 
and should you completely fail theoretically or at least historically they are allowed to answer on your behalf they're not oh. really supposed to do it but the idea is that these you know you don't you don't bring your you know neighbor or random best friend it has to be somebody who knows what you're doing so this is Judy Friedberg, who was at the time at ICA, and Beth Garrett, who was at the time um, at the Iranian Flames Tribunal, uh, who I worked with quite closely. And they're standing there watching me nervously as I'm trying to answer a question. Okay, what, what, is, what was the topic of for your thesis? The ancestral arbitration rules as applied by the Iranian Claims Tribunal. Ah, so you were uh, involved in arbitration already at the time when you were at university, right? Actually, before that, even when I was doing, and, uh, and I, I, I'm afraid that that's one of the pictures you also have, even when I was just doing my, my basic law course, I did some yeah. arbitration, which, yeah. Wait a second, uh, I have uh, some more, yes, uh, I, I should have some, some more. No. This is this one? No? Yes. So this okay. is, no, yeah, this one. This is where I sign my name on the wall in the so-called sweat room, where you sit to wait for the outcome, I mean, traditionally, where you would wait for outcome of results. Um, so I just finished law school, and then you see my parents who are holding the ladder. They signed the same wall a few de decades before that when they finished medical school in, in the same university. So where is this wall? In in the oldest building of the um, university building in Leiden. Oh, really? So, the, so if, yeah. if I go to university building, I can still uh, find uh, some Absolutely. knowledge you made, you know, number of years ago? So when you go to my, when you come to my inaugural lecture, which is now not going to take place in June, but probably in December, then you can still see this wall and every student who graduates um, puts their name on the on the wall. <laughs> What's a nice tradition. Yeah. This is really nice. Um, and also, uh, can, can you tell us, is it you on this photo? It is, it is. And it is when I, this is before that, you're, you, the chronology is a little off. Um, I was, just one second, let me check how the potatoes are doing. They're not doing very well. Um, this is me in a single skull. Um, I used to row when I was in uh, high school. Um, and, um, well, perhaps it tells you something about what a great team player I am. I used to single skull. Um, and this is at the end of some strange race. And I don't quite remember where this was because it was a, on a river, typically you would have races on a, on a special sort of rowing course, but this was a long distance course, uh, long distance race. Um, and I just finished, which is kind of why I leaned back. Yeah. So but I yeah. would have been 16, I think, in that picture. Yeah. But, but this is a pretty serious sport. Uh, you need to be pretty yes. strong to do it. Yes. It's and, amazing. and you need to be able to concentrate more than anything oh, else. Concentrate. <laughs> okay, uh, so, uh, and, and this photo, what time is it? Well, this is special. So you're now back to the PhD, um, okay. and you see me again. And then on the left, you see Pete Saunders, the godfather of arbitration, who is the reason why I took up arbitration. He was a colleague of my parents, who were professors in, in Rotterdam, and oh. one of the few lawyers, I think, that they knew. So when I needed to write a paper in university, they said, well, go and speak to Pete. And Pete said, what you want is arbitration, which I then had to look up in the dictionary because I, I had never heard of arbitration. So I did my master's paper on arbitration. I did my PhD. And this is where Pete congratulates me on the PhD in, I think, 1991, it would have been. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good. Uh, are you drinking wine? I am drinking wine. Yes. Okay. So I suggest at the right time, you know, to drink Cheers. a little bit of wine. Cheers. <laughs> I'm going to check how everything is going here. Potatoes are boiling and asparagus are boiling. Um, so let's put on a timer because, you know, with all this wine, you should not forget. 
10 minutes and then I check the, um, uh, asparagus. In the meantime, I'm going to peel the eggs. I hope that I scared them sufficiently. Do you have any more scary pictures or are we done? Uh, we, we do have, they're not scary, uh, but uh, before we go to the pictures, um, uh, uh, after, after you finish your thesis on arbitration, yeah. I understood that you were in private, in private practice. That's right, that's right, yeah. Uh, and uh, when, I, when I read your CV, I actually, uh, first time realized that you were trainee at Baker McKenzie. Was it New York or? That's right. Well, so yeah, I've been in private practice for about 25 years before I joined the LCA. But while I was doing my PhD, um, I spent four months or something like that, not very long, with uh, Baker McKenzie New York because Baker McKenzie was the depository of all filings by claimants before the Iran News Claims Tribunal. So it was a really vital, uh, and the story that Grant Inessian always told me was that it was some smart associate who said, why don't we team up um, all these American claimants and collect all our submissions and keep them in one place? And I think those are the documents which are now in Berkeley, because I think David Karen was instrumental in, in, in then taking over those records. But at the time, it was a really important place to be in if you wanted, this is before internet, so if you wanted to, to study what was happening at the tribunal, one of the best places to do it was to, to be there. So I worked with Arthur Rovine and um, the then very young uh, associate, Grant Hanessian. So that's my, ba <laughs> that's my Baker connection. Yeah, he's, he's still with Baker. You know why I'm asking is because when I was preparing um, uh, to our webinar, I look into, uh, in my summer house, in my Dutch, what, 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 what kind of Dutch stuff I have. And I found uh, nice uh, uh, Dutch <laughs> shoes. You know, it, it has oh Baker, Baker McKenzie, Baker McKenzie logo is this is old logo, but it's still uh, here. And we have partners meeting um, in in Amsterdam, uh, and everyone was presented with such kind of wooden shoes. And uh, do you wear them? I tried. Yes. Honestly, I tried, and I found them <laughs> extremely inconvenient. Uh, yes, they it, hurt. It, it's, it's, it looked like a torture. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I'm wondering, is it really the case that the people used to wear kind of uh, wooden shoes in the Netherlands? I think actually people still wear them, um, but only, well, apparently they're really good if you want to work in sort of muddy soil and you can slip out of them quite easily. So there's really nothing else that is as, well, I don't want to say comfortable, but as convenient for walking in sort of semi-wet soil and then leaving them outside at the kitchen door and, 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 and stepping out. But I think you wear, well, first of all, thick socks and maybe, maybe even some sort of inner shoe. I must admit, I'm a bit of a city girl, so I'm not the best person to ask. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I saw that people might adjust, you know, uh, the shoes to the shape of, of, uh, of the feet. Um, maybe no no you suffer you just suffer that's, that's suffer. all there's to it <laughs> you just suffer <laughs> okay <laughs> this is what make dutch people strong huh exactly <laughs> okay um uh, coming back to pictures i have a very nice picture uh, uh to show you uh aha uh -huh. by the way this one is uh, where you wait, wait a second i need to share uh, the picture with other people uh, wait a second. Um, uh, I cannot. What's going on? Why I cannot share? Me, maybe wine. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Wine is making me more, <laughs> <laughs> more, more difficult. <laughs> you see now picture. Ah, yes, I do, I do. Okay, uh, tell us about this picture, what is it? Yeah, so this was my first job after doing my PhD. 
And some of you may recognize the, should we, maybe this is a good quiz, Vladimir. Should we ask people which, which room they think this is? Is it PCA? Yes, but you, you're not supposed to answer. This is not the ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry for spoiling the question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the small, um, uh, small hall in, in the Peace Palace. And I was a tribunal secretary to the US-UK Heathrow Tribunal, um, uh, well, between the United States and the United Kingdom. So I worked for the tribunal for uh, a year and we had a month long hearing in the Peace Palace. So it, it was a pretty steep um, promotion from, from an obscure academic to sitting you know, at this table where most people only sit when they're um, 85 and have a lot less hair than I have in that picture. But of course, I was only there as the tribunal secretary. But it was quite an quite an amazing experience. Yeah, uh, and uh, I want you to show one very nice painting. I believe you must recognize it. Mm, I do, although it's it is a little bit different in the sense that bits have been cut off. Um, and I was I, this is not a picture I selected, so you must must have done your homework well. It's um, a picture I bought in um, Abuja, in Nigeria, I think two years ago. Um, well, I like negotiating, uh, bargaining. So um, in Abuja, I, I didn't have the opportunity to move around very much, but I did go to a little sort of market where some artists had um, some paintings and Almost as a joke, I started haggling over um, a painting. Um, and maybe because I wasn't, at the time, obsessed enough with it, I did a pretty good job. And my Nigerian hosts later told me that I should um, not pay or should have called them to help me uh, because I shouldn't have paid more than, I think they said 90 or 95% of the asking price. And I think I, I paid 5% of the asking price. But it's actually a very special painting. There's a bit more air on top and sand underneath. And it's a very moving picture of a displaced person's camp in, in northern Nigeria. And there's something about it because it's so narrow and long and it gives this impression of movement and the colors. Um, so I, I, I found it incredibly moving picture, which I took home with my, I unframed it and had it reframed, re structured and it's now in my study here uh in um, in hague right in the hague yeah yeah yeah, yeah uh, you were uh i think one of the first persons who raced in 2014 at ICA miami congress uh the problem with diversity in international arbitration and the reason why i'm uh, showing you this picture because you refer to this picture and you said that uh, you were amazed looking at these people because all the people were different, but they were equal in some sense because they are moving in the same direction. And then you made That's some right. kind of pa parallel uh, in um, in international arbitration, right? Yeah. You remember it? I do, I do. And 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 it kind of special. This is just before I joined the LCIA, and I um, didn't invent this myself, but I I had read about an in initiative years earlier when American law firms took this pledge to, to effectively force law firms to have inclusive teams when they uh, pitched for work. And I suggested that we would do something similar in arbitration where, for instance, arbitrators would refuse to take on a, an appointment if they felt that the tribunal wasn't sufficiently uh, di diverse. So it was really telling people it's about what you can do. It's not just about what other people can do. And at the time, I didn't focus specifically on gender, but the pledge, which was you know picked up by 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 others, and in particular by Sylvia Nouri, who who's really made this into something tangible. Gender is perhaps one of the easier, difficult as it is, because it's very concrete. And it's quite um, clear what your targets are, namely 50%, and, and you can measure that. Um, what was also special about, it's not just the painting that is special, but 
what is special about the circumstances when I was in, in Nigeria to promote the pledge, at the time that was the pledge on, on, on inclusion um, uh, of, of women, uh, a lot of African practitioners rightly stressed the importance of racial inclusivity as well. So I have very special memories of that trip because it, it highlights that you know, diversity is more than gender diversity. It's about every kind of diversity and, and we're all in this together and we need to work on all those kinds of diversity. I'm gonna poke my asparagus if you yes, bear yeah. with me for a moment because we do need to eat at some point. Now, a few more minutes, but they're almost ready. Potatoes, not yet. I'm gonna put the butter on at a very low temperature. Okay, oops, that's that. And then back to my wine. Yeah, uh, and, and, and my questions. Uh, so yes, yes. after you started this pledge in, in arbitration, do you believe it changed a situation with diversity in arbitration? How do you see it? I think it was 2014, right? Now we're six years later. That's right. That's right. Uh, do I you think see the changes? Massively, yeah, I think it's massively changed the environment. And I think certainly with hindsight, focusing initially on gender was really smart and really important because I don't think the pledge would have gained the traction that it has gained. The challenge is now going to be to move from gender. But if I look at the numbers, so this is a bit of a sneak preview. Um, the 2019 LCA numbers have not yet been published. They will be published shortly. The LCA selects arbitrators um, in addition to the parties and co-arbitrators selecting arbitrators. And for LCA selected arbitrators, we've achieved 47% female appointees last year. So that's almost a gender parity. And I think the reason why the pledge has been so successful is it gives institutions, co-arbitrators, people something that they can refer to. Even when they feel a bit uncomfortable discussing gender, they can say, well, it's not just me, it's not just my personal perspective, but I think you know, my, my law firm has signed up to um, the pledge or uh, the, this company has signed up the, uh, the pledge. It's almost as if you can blame somebody else or at least point to something very concrete in support of your desire to promote diversity. So yes, I think it has been. And if you look at other institutions um, and, and appointment numbers, the number of female appointees has risen enormously. Yeah, and I have a couple of questions with this regard because um, we in Russian Arbitration Association, we published monthly electronic journal, which is uh, available at our website. And my tradition was dev uh, devoted to diversity and arbitration. We have statistics from various institutions, including LCAA. And uh, what I found uh, a little bit strange, you see here, uh, the ratio of one of um, a man and woman, women appointed by LCA, and you see that uh, appointments by LCA is growing, female appointments by LCA is growing. But if you look into party appointments, you see that uh, there was some race in 2017 and then it was dropped uh, to 2018. Yeah. So yeah. the parties are still pretty reluctant uh, to appoint yeah. uh, female arbitrators. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have the precise numbers here and, and I would not necessarily uh, disclose them anyhow, but I think for 2019, we get up to a, a total average of 23 to 24%. So given that the court accounts for 47%, you see that parties and co-arbs are lagging behind. I think the, um, the drop you just showed was very um, uh, unfortunate. And I, I don't know because it, it did coincide with people talking a lot more about diversity. There was a lot of discussion that people saw many lists, including women, but it was more like going through the motion. So co-arbitrators would say, oh yeah, we do need to put some women on the list, but then really nothing would be done with it. The situation has improved. The situation can improve further. It goes to my point that I don't think parties are necessarily the best place to make selections anyhow. 
and the same to a large extent applies to co-arbitrators. I think institutions are often better placed. We know the market better than than individual parties or even co-arbitrators. You know, if you see the number of appointments an institution makes, I think we just know the market very well, especially given that certainly at the LCA, the appointments we make are typically the chairs and the sole arbitrators. So arguably the more difficult slots where we require previous experience and still we are able to find women to fill the slots. So it is taking time, but I don't think we should be too pessimistic about it. Actually, those numbers are quite forceful and, and law firms are, are definitely doing what they can. Oops, I yeah. hear I've sounds. Got, yeah, I've got important question from our participants. Yes. What, what to do with the butter? Yes. Oh, sorry, the butter. Um, I, I can show you. Maybe this is a good moment to um, look in the pans, I hope. Oops. Nope, that was not a very good idea. Yeah, um, we're losing. Oh, now you're back. Yes. All right, am I back? Okay. Yes, you're Let back. Me try and, okay. So I will open all the. Uh, can you can you put can it on a, uh, on yeah. a different yeah. angle? We can. Oh, now we can see. Yeah. Uh, so the butter melted, right? It is boiling. Butter is melted there. Asparagus there, and potatoes there. Okay. okay. And here you see the oven where the serving dishes are waiting. Okay. So, um, you need to hurry up because actually everything is, is nearing completion. <laughs> okay, I have very few questions to, uh, to finish. Uh, uh, about but the potatoes are, not, potatoes are not ready yet. So okay, good. So I, uh, I still have a little bit of time. Okay, uh, just a second. Um, I want to show you, wait a second, uh, uh, some LCA statistics. Yeah. Uh, for last uh, 18 years, because 2018 is not uh, available yet. And you see that number of cases grew significantly uh, in the last yes. 20 years, including the time when you were at LCA, there was some drop, but I understand that before, uh, normally between crises, there could be some drop. So tell me what you believe are your major achievements uh, with LCA. Oh, <laughs> well, um, in terms of numbers, I don't think numbers are... We are cannot see you. I see only... Okay. Uh, um, let me... Um, can you check? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Am I back? Um, I think numbers are a combination of factors. I mean, no, numbers are certainly not attributable to one person only. And I think... Um, uh, what I think I've been part of is professionalizing the LCIA. It has grown and that has required professionalization. And I think that's worked. And I think that in turn has then led to um, increasing uh, trust in the institution. Um, I think also changes to the organization, um, uh, making it more robust. And, and I think what we've been seeing now with the crisis the, the fact that we were able to convert the organization into a remote institution within effectively a week shows that it was not the organization that it was 10 years ago, much smaller and, and, and more, more dependent on, on a few individuals. So it's a much more robust organization. I think in terms of uh, specific initiatives, diversity has definitely been one of my um, uh, focuses and, and something I'm very proud of. And I do think that I personally have contributed to, to the increase in diversity. Yeah, and, and if, you, if I ask you, how would you uh, describe LCA uh, as different from other arbitration institutions? Because what we see these days, uh, if you look into rules, the rules of all arbitration institutions are more or less the same. Because if one institution introduces emergency arbitrator in a couple of years, you'll see other institutions doing the same. If one institution starts publishing reasons for challenges, uh, then other institutions do the same. So if I ask you what are three major specific selling points of LCA, how LCA is different than any yeah. other institution, yeah. what you would say? Well, I think the, the, the primary difference, and, and again, that is something which I have started to speak much more explicitly about than, than, than previously, 
is the remuneration system is completely different and that is a much more cost effective system so the hourly rate based system works out cost efficiently for users across the board so both for smaller and for larger cases and i did appreciate that if you don't publicize that with real numbers people don't necessarily believe it if you have an ad valorem system you can have a, you can have a cost calculator on the website and you it's can it's more predictable well, it's more predictable, um, but, but it's also more transparent. So I decided that we would go the full Monty, if you will, and give actual numbers. So not only a cost calculator in abstract, but give actual numbers. And in fact, one of the things we're doing in this period is updating the cost and duration um, uh, uh, analysis. So that it's going to be the third time that we p publish numbers. I think cost and the fact that our system is is cost effective is the biggest distinguishing factor compared to other institutions now number two and that is related i think lca arbitrations are time efficient um 16 months duration so we have not really seen the need to uh, introduce too many specific um procedural um, um, procedures like expedited. We may do that, but I think already for average proceedings, we're seeing a very, a very swift um, uh, uh, pattern of these cases where the institution only intervenes in administration if and when really necessary. I think that's a big difference, which I also see as arbitrator. Different institutions have a different way of administrating. We are very hands off if we can, and it is only if and when there are issues that we get in, involved in the, in the arbitration. And I think the third thing ties into the LCA's position as being international and London. A lot of our cases are governed by English law, not because they have anything to do with English parties, but for instance, in banking and finance, which is an important part of our caseload, people want English law. And we are closer to the arbitrators who are best at dealing with those cases. Yeah, and I have a couple of slides here uh, to show yeah. those people. And you will see, for example, I'll say statistics on seat and applicable law. And you'll see that England uh, is, is normally seat uh, for LCA cases and English law as well. And then if you look into nationality of arbitrators, you also see that majority of arbitrators are British. Um, so which makes LCA, uh, at least uh, some people believe that uh, it is very Anglo-centric institution. I don't yeah. know whether it's good or bad. I personally believe it's good. Uh, <laughs> you, bear with me, because I need to do something with the potatoes. I will yes, answer okay. your question. But so first of all, I'm now going to get rid of the water. So the potatoes are done, I hope. I pricked them a little, they look done. Um, so that's done. And I'm going to get the ham out of the fridge. I hope my family has not eaten the ham. No, they haven't. Uh, so to come back to your question about um, English law and, and um, to what extent the organization is, is Anglo-centric, um, if you look at the pattern of English law and English seat, you will see that in the last three years, there's been a considerable increase in non-English law governed cases and non-English seated cases. And what is very interesting is with a few exceptions, and I can talk more about one notable exception, it's not as if people will choose, for instance, Nigerian law and Nigerian seat. You see be people becoming increasingly creative, saying, I like the, 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 the case to be seated in London, but with Nigerian law, or the case to be seated in Athens, but with English law. So there's a bit of mixing and matching. An exception is some of the quite many Mexican cases that we have where you see both Mexican law and Mexican seat. But that's the exception. So we're seeing more cases where people choose something other than English law or English seat, and they're choosing different combinations. And that's one of the things that I'm working on without trying to suggest that it's a bad thing. As you say, I think London is, according to the Queen Mary study, 
the premier place of arbitration uh, in the world. Now, there are many other good places of arbitration, but we should be very careful not to throw away the baby with the potato water. Uh, England is simply a very good place of arbitration and English law is very popular, as you know, also with Russian parties. There are many other laws and we can handle all of them, but it doesn't mean that English law is a bad thing. Okay, people asking what to do with ham. We need to come back to asparagus. Yes, yes, exactly. I took it out of the fridge. I'm now slicing um, or cutting the eggs in half. So we will end up with 12 halves. So do that. And my eggs are perfect. They are not completely hard, but they are not. Sort of, oh, I can show you without, yeah. if you see the eggs, nice yes. color. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, um, I hope everybody has heated the um, serving dish. Mine is warm, but not too warm. So what I'm going to do is put the potatoes in the serving dish. And there goes the cholesterol. I'm going to add even more butter. Even more butter. I know, this is, this is because of you, Vladimir. I mean, normally I would be eating healthy olive oil, but because of this performance, we're eating butter. And then I'm adding all the green herbs to the potatoes. Um, and I will get a serving spoon for that. We're almost nearing the end. If you have any remaining questions, Vladimir, this is your chance. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I have only suggestion to our participants if they followed uh, your CP, they have uh, to to go tomorrow morning for jogging. Yes, uh, exactly. That's compulsory. That's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, Roman, Roman Zikov is asking where the potatoes are pile, peeled. No, I didn't peel them. I mean, um, I'm sorry. I thought I, I I mentioned that maybe not. I prefer them with peel certainly at this time of the year because the peel is actually very thin and, and, and nice to eat um also it's a hassle i mean well we would get them scraped in the in the green grocer but no i don't peel them and then i get my serving platter out for the asparagus and that's where the ham comes in so i'm first gonna put the um asparagus on the platter um I'm not sure if you can see this, but I will show the platter in a moment. So they're quite beautiful. So they go on the warm plate. Oops. This is what you're not supposed to see when you're yeah, when somebody's we'll, we'll, cooking. We'll cut it for video when we put it on YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the asparagus are now on the platter. And remember that I washed my hands. I'm now going to take the ham, which is a really nice uh, uh, bone ham, which the butcher sliced slightly thicker than normal. And I'm going to roll it up just in, you know, I think in Russia, you often have this with the, the salad. Um, no, you have these rolls of ham. I, remember seeing them. So you roll up the ham and it looks a bit like asparagus. Any more questions, Vladimir? Because we're almost there. Yeah, well, in Russia we say war is war, but dinner should go according to the schedule. And so people are reminding <laughs> exactly. me that it's already 7 uh, p.m. in Europe and people are, ha are, are hungry. Uh, so exactly. I would, I would probably well, skip my remaining questions. Uh, Excellent. Uh, because okay, people want so to eat. Done. And I understand we're almost done, right? That we're done. So I'm now going to put the eggs on here as well. And then we're there. And then I'm going to... I've not heard my children, which is slightly worrying. Um, but sometimes how, how many children do you have? Um, Two excluding my husband. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a 15 year old girl and a 17 year old boy who are 
you know, doing school from home. Um, so, okay. This is the melted butter. I'm going to show you all in a moment, but I'm putting it in a warm serving thing. This is very full. Um, yes, and then I will add, okay, put the roll. This is also very Dutch. I need to show you. We rarely use this, but this is an asparagus thing, just for serving asparagus. So we use it twice a year. Okay, I'm going to show you the result. It looks so you delicious. Have the asparagus, I even, I even and can, can smell it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, there you go. That's it. Okay, Jackie, thank you very much. It was excellent. And what is important was in time. Uh, so we expected you to finish by seven, you finished by seven. And um, I wish uh, all luck to your family. Be safe uh, and stay home at these days. Okay? You too. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you very much to everyone. Enjoy your, your dinner. Bye. Okay, I'm switching off. Uh, by the way, Jackie, I promise you to have uh, a nice surprise at the end uh, of our webinar. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not as good as you in bargaining, and I, I'm afraid I am a victim of Nigerian uh, talented people, because uh, yesterday I looked at the website of Nigerian artist and found this painting, which you liked uh, so much, and I bought it already as the price I quoted and arrange delivery uh, to LCA. So after the situation with what is over, over uh, you will receive uh, another copy of a nice painting which you have already.